Hi everyone, this lesson is on roseola and phantom, which is a common cause of a high fever and a rash in young infants. So we're going to talk about the causes for this condition, we'll also talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So roseola and phantom is also known as exanthem subitum, or sixth disease. So it is a viral infection that affects very young children and it causes a very high fever and rash. We'll get into more specific details when we talk about the signs and symptoms later on. Now, this condition is caused by human herpes virus 6 or HHV6. So human herpes virus 6 is a double-stranded DNA virus. And there are actually two variants of this virus, HHV6A and 6B. Now, 6B is going to be the causative agent in roseola and phantom. And some cases will have HHV7 as a potential cause, but most cases will be HHV6B. Now, this condition is a relatively common disease that occurs during childhood, and it's mostly going to occur in young infants between the ages of 6 to 12 months. And this condition is so common, in fact, that nearly all older children will have been exposed to HHV6B. So, very common condition. By adulthood, nearly 100% of people have been exposed to this virus, and numbers are different depending on the sources, but some sources say up to 12 months of age, 44% of young infants have been exposed, and by the age of 2 years old, 77% have been exposed. So again, very common condition. Now, HHV6 remains latent in the immunocompetence, so after they've cleared the infection, it is remains in essentially a inactive state within patients who have a good immune system. And what we do find is that HHV6A, which is the other variant that doesn't cause roseola and phantom, is actually an important cause of disease in the immunosuppressed, so in patients with AIDS and in transplant recipients. So very important to think about HHV6A is the one that's going to affect adults primarily and those who are immunocompromised especially. So a couple ways to remember this, we talked about roseola and phantom being also known as sixth disease. So we can remember that human herpes virus six and we can remember sixth disease. And then with regards to the two variants, HHV6B is going to be the one that's going to be the cause. And we can remember B for baby and HHV6A, A for adult. So this is going to be the one that's going to be most found in older adults, especially immunosuppressed adults. So now let's talk about how young infants can be infected by human herpes virus 6. So what we're going to find is that this virus is present in the saliva. So it's going to be spread mostly from other children who are infected. So younger babies, other children who have been exposed to this virus, they have it in their saliva, even when they're in the convalescent phase, which is when they're recovering. So even after they've experienced the worst of symptoms and they recovered, they still are secreting this virus in their saliva. And when a young infant that hasn't been exposed to this virus is exposed to it, it's going to infect their salivary glands and their white blood cells. And it's going to enter into their cells via a cellular receptor known as CD46. This is how this virus enters cells. And once it's in the salivary glands in white blood cells, it's going to multiply. So it's going to multiply in leukocytes and salivary glands. This is the reason why we can see it in their saliva, because it's residing in the salivary glands. And then it's often going to target CD4 plus T cells more specifically. Now, this virus can also traverse the blood-brain barrier. It can enter into the central nervous system. And we're going to talk about why that's important a little later on in this lesson. And then in more rare cases, it can also invade other bodily systems, including the gastrointestinal system and the hepatic system, so the liver. So again, invasion into other bodily systems is rare, but it can invade into the central nervous system. Now, it's also important to make note of the fact that because most young children are exposed to this virus, many cases are going to be asymptomatic. They're going to be exposed to the virus, but they're not going to show any signs or symptoms. But where they do show signs and symptoms, they're going to have a very high fever and the fever is going to be around 40 degrees celsius or 104 degrees fahrenheit or even higher and it's going to have a very characteristic sudden onset so all of a sudden the fever is going to spike to that very high level we talked about before and because of this very high fever some patients may have a febrile seizure so febrile seizure febrile means fever so it's going to be a seizure due to that very high fever and this occurs in roughly 15 percent of patients 
And this is also related to the fact that this virus can enter into the central nervous system. So this is the reason why we can see very high fevers and febrile seizures in a minority of patients. And in fact, HHV6 is actually a very important cause of febrile seizures in young infants. Approximately 10 to 45% of febrile seizures are going to be caused by HHV6 infections. And this fever is going to last for roughly three days. It may last for up to five days, but typically it's going to last around three days. And then what's going to happen is there's going to be a rapid defervescence. Defervescence means that the fever essentially drops very quickly. So the temperature is going to be very high, and then all of a sudden it's going to rapidly drop back to normal range. And then right after that rapid defervescence, a morbilliform rash is going to occur. So a rash is going to look like this. So it's going to be spread throughout the trunk and the face. And this is where we get the term exanthem subitum. So exanthem is actually the term for a skin manifestation, generally a rash that occurs on the body. And subitum means suddenly. So it's going to be a sudden onset of a rash. Again, this is going to occur post fever. So after the fever. And the rash can be generalized. It can occur on the trunk and the face. So on the chest, belly, back, and on the face. It's going to be maculopapular, so it's going to be a mixture of macules and papules. So macules are going to be flat, papules are going to be raised, but they're going to be smaller, and they're going to be roughly one to five millimeters in diameter. And they're going to be pink, and if you were to actually touch or push on them, they're blanchable, meaning that even if they look pink or red, if you were to actually press down, put pressure on each of those little spots of the rash, you'll find that you can actually push out that redness from it so it's blanchable. It's also going to be non-paritic so it's not itchy and the rash itself can last for two days so usually two days but in some cases it only may last for one day. So very important fever comes first then roughly three days later the fever subsides and then a rash occurs. So very important with roseola infantum fever comes first then rash so fever then rash. What we can also find is that we can see something called Nagayama spots. These occur in roughly two-thirds of patients. So Nagayama spots are what we would call the enanthem. So enanthem is any dermatological manifestations that occur internally, so things that we can't generally see on the outside. So this is what we're going to see in the mouth or the oral cavity. And it's going to be erythematous papules. So erythematous meaning reddened papules are, again, these little raised skin lesions less than 10 millimeters in diameter by definition. They occur on the soft palate. So if you're to look inside the mouth, this is the soft palate here. And they also occur at the base of the uvula. The uvula is this thing that hangs down in the back of the throat. So it's going to be at the base of the uvula. So the soft palate and uvula may have these little spots or these erythematous papules. And again, these occur in roughly two thirds of patients with roseola infantum. These are are also known as uvulopalatoglossal spots. And other signs and symptoms that can occur include malaise, so the little infant's going to generally feel very unwell, lymphadenopathy, so swollen tender lymph nodes, irritability, conjunctivitis, so an inflammation of the conjunctiva of the eye, diarrhea, sore throat, and otitis is also a possibility, so this can be a middle ear infection. And then there are possible complications. We talked about, in some rare cases, the virus invading other bodily systems and causing a clinically significant manifestation in those bodily systems. So some of the potential complications can include gastroenteritis, hepatitis, or an inflammation of the liver, and hepatosplenomegaly, which is an enlargement of the liver and the spleen. And again, these complications are going to be very rare, but they can occur in little infants who are themselves immunosuppressed. So if they have a poor immune system functioning, they may be more susceptible to these potential complications. Let's talk about how clinicians diagnose and treat roseola infantum. So the diagnosis is going to be a clinical diagnosis. So looking at the history and physical examination, especially if you see a little infant, six to 12 months of age, they have this very high fever that occurs suddenly, 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit, and then it lasts for three days where they don't generally have many other symptoms. They might just have the fever and maybe some other vague symptoms we talked about before. And then three days later, that fever suddenly subsides and then they have this sudden onset of a rash. That is often enough to make this diagnosis. If you were to actually look at the blood work, there can be transient elevations in white blood cell count. And if you were to actually look at a piece of the tissue of where these HHV6 viruses infect, you can see what we would call ballooning cells. But generally speaking, it's only going to be a clinical diagnosis. Now, how do clinicians treat this condition? So this is going to be a self-limiting condition. And because it's a viral condition, there are no specific treatments for it. 
Often they're going to be supportive. So whatever signs and symptoms the infant is having, this is something that we're going to treat, just the symptoms. So fluids are going to be important. And because of that very high fever, antipyretic medications like acetaminophen and ibuprofen can be used to help reduce the fever. And then using cold cloths can also be helpful as well. And if there are any other complications, treatment of those complications will be important. But most of the time, it's going to be a self-limiting infection that only requires supportive treatments. Please check out my lesson on Kawasaki fever and also on placenta previa. And if you found this lesson helpful, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.